Welcome back to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Fellman, mom, homeschooler, educator. So today, chapter four of Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. This chapter is entitled, We Need Less School, Not More. And apparently, uh, the I guess it's the editor who, or, who compiled this. I'm not sure. Maybe this was him. Uh, this essay is a personal favorite, was written especially for the first edition and presented many times as a public speech before the book was published. So here's the opening quote. We were making the future, he said, and hardly any of us troubled to think what future we were making. And here it is. The Sleeper Awakes, H.G. Wells. So as I go through this chapter, I want you to think again about the fact that this was written 25 years ago that he actually says, you know, it was given before the book was published. So the book was actually published 25 years ago. So probably it was, this was written before that. He taught for over 30 years. So everything I'm about to share with you um, was, you know, from his perspective all those years ago. And then imagine where we are now. This chapter focuses heavily on the core problem with mass schooling that it disintegrates communities that it is not a community it does not create a community no matter what it calls itself no matter how much they like to use the word community to talk about your school community and our you know or the classroom community and so forth or even the district community it's not a community he calls it a network and he does explain the difference between a network and a community. It's something I'd never thought about. I never really understood the difference between the two. And he does an excellent job of explaining the difference. Um, but initially, he opens up by just stating right up front that he's run across a lot of people who want more school. And they want to extend the school day. They want kids to go to school for longer. Um he points to the fact that in order to provide an economical solution to the problems posed by the decay of the American family, in other words, child care, um, we don't have extended family living nearby or at home, and oftentimes there are single pa parent households, um, people have talked about extending the school day. And he says, um, because of this, uh, he says, I think this is when they have trouble understanding the real difference between communities and networks, or even the difference between families and networks. Because of this confusion, they conclude that replacing a bad network with a good one is the right way to go. Since I disagree so strongly with the fundamental premise that networks are workable substitutes for families, and because from anybody's point of view, a lot more school is going to cost a lot more money, I thought I'd tell you why, from a school teacher's perspective, we shouldn't be thinking of more school but of less. And he says, you know, people who admire our school institution usually admire networking in general. And they have an easy time seeing it as a positive, seeing the positive side of it. But they overlook its negative aspect. Networks, even good ones, drain the vitality from communities and families. They provide mechanical by the number solutions to human problems. When a slow organic process of self-awareness, self-discovery, and cooperation is what is required for if any solution is to stick. And then he gives the explanation, what is a network? Okay, what is it? He says... Think of the challenge of losing weight. It's possible to employ mechanical tricks to do this quickly, but I'm told that 95% of the poor souls who do so are only fooling themselves. The weight loss the, the weight loss this way doesn't stay off. It comes back in a short time. Other network solutions are just as temporary. A group of law students may network to pass their college exams, but preparing a brief in private practice is often a solitary, lonely experience. Aristotle saw a long time ago that fully participating in a complex range of human affairs was the only way to become fully human. In that, he differed from Plato. What is gained from consulting a special what is gained <clears throat> from consulting a specialist and surrendering all judgment is often more than outweighed by a permanent loss of one's own volition. This discovery accounts for the curious texture of real communication, where people argue with their doctors, lawyers, and ministers, tell craftsmen what they want instead of accepting what they get, frequently make their own food from scratch instead of buying it in a restaurant or defrosting it, and perform many similar acts of participation. A real community is, of course, a collection of real families who themselves function in this participatory way. Networks, however, don't require the whole person, but only a narrow piece. If, on the one hand, you function in a network, it asks you to suppress all the parts of yourself except the network interest part, a highly unnatural act, although one you can get used to. Now, think of the school. 
kids go to school and hear welcome to the school community, but you only function as a community when you're there, when you're in the building. I remember when I was teaching, I might run into a student of mine at the grocery store. If I happened to stop at that grocery store on my way home to the city where I lived, I didn't actually live in the community where I taught and the kids, the, the child might see me and just stare not expecting me to be there. I think my first grade students thought I lived in the closet at the building or something. They couldn't imagine me in the outside world. I even had a couple of students say, you know, what are you doing here? And it looks so weird for you to be here. Things like that. Why would it, why would it look so strange for the person they spend every day of their young life with eight months out of the year to be at the grocery store where they shop for their groceries? Why would that be such an aberration? I'm not a celebrity, okay? I'm a teacher. So the reason is that the school is a network. It, it, it exists to serve a specific mechanical function, a specific purpose, and to try to attribute to it community status, to say that you have natural, organic interactions with people when you're inside that building is just false. It's not true. So no, you can't replace the family or the extended family with the school. You, I don't care if you hire social workers, counselors, uh, you know, especially trained expert teachers in this or that special need. It will not replace people who sincerely care and live where you live and see you every day in a different range of human experiences. Can't be done. And when I think about people today saying, open the schools, open the schools, get the school. These kids are depressed. Open the schools. I'm sorry to tell you that part of the reason I think so many kids are depressed is not that they're not in the school, they're ersatz family, they're fake community. I think they're depressed because being home all the time when they should be in school is just putting it into sharp relief that home is not really home the way it ought to be. And especially if they're home and watching movies or TV or networking because Hollywood hasn't gotten the memo. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? Hollywood movies that depict families living in towns or suburbs, everybody's running across the street to their best friend who lives right there and everybody waves and everybody knows each other and we go by the local store and we know the guy who owns it and all the Hallmark Christmas movies were like that, right? It's We all look at them going, why don't I live in a town like that? Because that town doesn't exist or it exists, but it's a very small town and that's the only place it exists. It certainly doesn't exist in suburban America, subdivision America, which is most of America. And even points out that most of us at this point live in a very few urban areas in these large communities where if we move tomorrow, nobody would, I don't know my neighbors. I mean, I wave to them. I say, hello, I'm friendly. We, you know, how are you doing? How, you know, oh, look at this weather and da, da, da. Oh, can you believe that game or something? But I don't know their names and they don't know mine. And if I left, they probably wouldn't notice until a few months after I was gone. Um, so, you know, he he talks about how the caring in these networks is in some important way feigned, not maliciously, but in spite of any genuine emotional attractions that may be there, human behavior in network situations often resembles a dramatic act, matching a script produced to meet the demands of a story. I'm not going to lie. I go into my class and be like, hi, how was your weekend? What did you guys do? I do it for my students now, even with my ESL teaching. They're off in China and I'm, you know, permagrin. The second the camera goes off, my smile goes away. It's, it's not to say I don't care. I do care. And I did care about my students in the classroom. I wasn't an uncaring person. I actually care more about them now that I'm out of the classroom than I did when I was in the classroom with them pretending to care because... I had a role to play. I had to play the nurturer. I was I couldn't be the nurturer. In fact, we had strict rules. Don't you don't hug them, don't touch them, don't if they have trouble in, in the restroom, you you can't do anything. You have to call their parent if the parent can't come. I mean, I had first graders who had accidents, couldn't help them because of rules, because of regulations, because of possible lawsuits. That's not nurturing, that's pretend nurturing. That's fake nurturing. I had kids cry because they fell down in the playground. I wasn't allowed to hug them wasn't allowed to touch them in any way, shape, or form. And that's not how real community behaves. It's not how they behaved 100 years ago. So they don't get that sense. It is a dramatic act. Um, 
And he says, network networks like schools are not communities, just a school training. It's not education. By preempting 50% of the total time of the young, by locking young people up with other young people exactly their own age, by ringing bells to start and stop work, by asking people to think about the same thing at the same time in the same way, by grading people the same way we grade vegetables and a dozen other vile and stupid ways, network schools steal the vitality of communities and replace them with an ugly mechanism. So it's like replacing people in human interaction with a sort of human face machine almost like AI. A community is a place in which people face each other over time and in all their human variety, good parts, bad parts, and all the rest. Such places promote the highest quality of life possible, lives of engagement and participation. This happens in unexpected ways, but it never happens when you've spent more than a decade listening to other people talk and trying to do what they'll tell you to do, trying to please them after a fas- after the fashion of schools. It makes a real lifelong difference when you avoid that training as it traps you. An example might clarify this. Networks of urban reformers will convene to consider the problems of homeless vagrants, but a community will think of its vagrants as real people, not abstractions. Ron, Dave, or Marty, a community will call its bums by their names. It makes a difference. And he uses the word bums, but again, it's 25 years ago. People interact on thousands of invisible pathways in a community, and the emotional payoff is correspondingly rich and complex. But a vampire network like a school, which tears off huge chunks of time and energy needed for building community and family and always asks for more, needs to have a stake driven through its heart to be and be nailed into its coffin. Networks divide people first from themselves and then from each other on the grounds that this is the efficient way to perform a task. It may well be, but it's a lousy way to feel good about being alive. Networks make lonely people. They cannot correct their inhuman mechanism and still succeed as networks. Behind the anomaly that networks look like communities, but are not, lurks the grotesque secret of mass schooling and the reason why enlarging the school domain will only aggravate the dangerous conditions of social disintegration it is intended to correct. I want to repeat this until you are sick of hearing it. Networks do great harm by appearing enough like real communities to create expectations that they can manage human, social, and psychological needs. The reality is they cannot. Even associations as inherently harmless as bridge clubs, chess clubs, amateur acting clubs, or groups of social activists will, if they maintain a presence of whole friendship, ultimately produce that odd sensation familiar to all city dwellers of being lonely in the middle of a crowd. And he says, you know, with a network, you get at the beginning all that you'll ever get. You don't deepen your connections over time. And in fact, a real community, if it keeps growing, if it grows and grows and grows, will die. It, it can't remain a community if it does that. Whereas a network not only can grow and grow and grow indefinitely, it will and it seeks to and it will continue to just like a vampire will just continue to bite off more and more and more of more people's time but never giving back any more than they got in the first place and that is the nature of schooling extending the school day is just going to take more away from families further disintegrated family and now you've got school curricula that are explicitly teaching children that the family is a form of oppression that it's rooted in white supremacy They're trying to get the children to ask for their family to be further disintegrated. It's not about making people feel better who don't have a nuclear family at home. It's trying to make them feel like having a nuclear family is actually a bad thing. So it can continue to increase its uh, its size and its scope because it's massive. It's absolutely massive. And he says, um, as we... He said, as we approach the 21st century, we're there. It is correct to say that the United States has become a nation of institutions, whereas it used to be a nation of communities. Large cities have great difficulty supporting healthy community life, partly because of the coming and going of strangers, partly because of space constructions, constrictions, partly because of poisoned environments, but mostly because of the constant competition of institutions and networks for the custody of children and old people, for not monopolizing the time of everyone else in between. By isolating young and old from the working life of places and by isolating the working population from the lives of the young and old, institutions and networks have brought about fundamental disconnection of the generations. The griefs that arise from this have no synthetic remedy, no vibrant, satisfying communities can come into being where old and young are locked away. And it is so, so true. And he says, you know, the suburbs have a thin illusion, but it's confined to street festivals, right? And... um, 
He says, when one is offered institutional simulations of community, a steady diet of networks involuntarily like schools or voluntarily like isolated workplaces divor divorced from human variety, basic human needs are placed in the gravest jeopardy, a danger magnified many times in the case of children. Institutional goals, however sane and well-intentioned, are unable to harmonize deeply with the uniqueness of individual human goals. So again, you know, it's no secret they're trying to disintegrate the individual they're trying to assign people to groups because they can't meet individual needs they literally can't so now they're trying to make it a good thing by making individualism a bad thing and making these institutions the center of all life but you're going to have more mental illness we see the mental illness kids are not depressed because the schools are closed like i said i think they're seeing how little they have going on outside of the school. It's not that the school is good or provides them with what they need. It's that the school helped mask. It, it, it just, it, it intensified the little bits of community they had. So they looked bigger than they actually were now that they're there all day. They're perceiving, they don't have it. They're perceiving there, there is no place that they really are, um, at, at home, even in their own home. And I know their parents out there and say, but I love my child and my child's at home. I'm doing my best. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure you are. I know I am. I'm experiencing this in my own home. Parents understand something. This vampire has eaten at American life for decades. It was a factor in your upbringing. It is not entirely your fault. There's a limit to how much you can recreate a community where it's been stripped away over the years by this massive institution and all the institutions that surround it and feed off it and depend on it. There's a limit to what you can do. So the first step, of course, is to recognize it and recognize that it's a real problem and recognize that it's even in the, the, the best of homes. I mean, even in my home, I, my kids are lonely. I am, it pains me. I want to tell them, you know, go outside, walk around. They're like, I don't know anybody. And I can say, you know, go knock on the neighbor's door. But I do understand why they don't want to do that. I don't want to do it, truth be told. I feel inhibited. I don't have the skills to do it. When I was young in the 70s and I lived in a town, you know, outside of New York, I, I was able to do it. Then once we moved to New York City, I absolutely couldn't do it. So I saw the difference right away that a city can make. And now the cities have just spread. We live in houses, but we really live in cities in those houses. And so we don't know how to do it either. So we can't even really help our kids. And I think that's why parents are going, open the school, open the school, because they feel like, well, that at least there was a community. There were people. They need that. They need the social justice. Yes, they do need people. But if you think they're getting that need met inside the school, I'm sorry to say, no, they're not. They're just being, they're being distracted from their needs, which is why so many of them are anxious. And so many of them turn to further distractions like social media and movies and games, because if they don't keep themselves constantly distracted from their inner life, from those feelings that make them aware of like, this doesn't feel safe and warm and comforting and, and real, they will get very depressed. So I really believe that that's what's happening. And that's why the pandemic has resulted in so many people seeing this, um, you know, increase in childhood depression is that they are so used to being told what to do, where to go, who to be friends with, who they are, what they should want, what they should do. They don't know how to do this for themselves, first of all. And they go to a place where they're, that structure's not there. They're not being told these things. They don't know how to do it. And they feel the absence. They feel it acutely. The answer is not to put them back in. Like he's saying, the answer is not open the schools and put them back into the, that environment. That's the environment that caused this disintegration in the first place. The solution is not back there. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and so he says, um, by redirecting the focus of our lives from families and communities to institutions and networks, we affect anoint a machine, our King. And it is a machine. The school's a machine. It's populated by people or it's run by people, but it is um, a machine. And then I think you might remember from the other day, I mentioned how these bureaucracies and machines, they, their first order of business is to keep themselves alive and growing. And he says nearly a century ago, a French sociologist wrote that every institution's unstated first goal is to survive and grow, not to undertake the mission it has nominally staked out for itself. The, thus, the first goal of government postal service is not to deliver the mail, it's to provide protection for its employees, etc. And then he says, um, it was 
this Philistine potential that teaching the young for pay would inevitably expand into an institution for the protection of teachers, not students, that made Socrates condemn the sophists so, so strongly long ago in ancient Greece. He refused to take pay to, to teach. And that's why he knew it would grow into something that would be a system for sustaining teachers, a jobs program, basically. This business we call education, when we mean schooling, makes an interesting example of network values in conflict with traditional community values. For 150 years, institutional education has seen fit to offer as its main purpose the preparation for economic success. Good education equals good job. This prescription makes both parent and student easier to regulate and intimidate as long as the connection goes unchallenged either for its veracity or in its philosophical truth. Interestingly enough, the American Federation of Teachers identifies one of its missions as persuading the business community to hire and promote on the basis of school grades so that the grades equal money equals money formula will obtain just as it was made to obtain for medicine and law after years of political lobbying. So if you think that the, the, the jobs come from the good grades, you know, like, oh, if you get good grades, you'll get good jobs. No, they've been lobbying the companies to hire the people with the good grades. And that is why so many job applications, job descriptions have these very specific requirements. And you might have looked at them yourself as an adult and said, but I know I could do this job. Why won't you even just interview me? Give me, I, let me, let me explain how I can do it. Nope. You must check off all these boxes. They've been lobbied by schools for that purpose. And there are schools that teach to that. Colleges even. So why then are we locking kids up in an involuntary network of strangers for 12 years or 13? Surely not so a few of them can get rich. Even if it worked that way, and I doubt that it does, why wouldn't any, why wouldn't any sane community look on such an education as positively wrong? It divides and classifies people, demanding that they compulsively compete with each other and publicly labels the losers by literally degrading them, identifying them as low-class material. And the bottom line for the winners is they can buy more stuff. I don't believe that anyone who thinks about that feels comfortable with such a silly conclusion. I can't help feeling that if we could only answer the question of what it is we want from these kids that we lock up, we would suddenly see where we took a wrong turn. I have every faith in American imagination and resourcefulness to believe that at a point, at that point, we'd come up with a better way. In fact, a whole supermarket of better ways. One thing I do know, though, most of us who've had a taste of loving families, even a little taste, want our kids to be part of one. Discovering meaning for yourself, as well as discovering satisfying purpose for yourself is a big part of what education is. How can this be done by locking children away from the world is beyond me. And he talks a little bit about pseudo, more about pseudo communities. He goes on at some length about that and, um, you know, what it can do to somebody when you're isolated. So more of the same, you know, he kind of goes into more detail and it gives more explanation, so you you'll get a lot out of that when you read the chapter. I'm again, this is a highlight reel so that I'm not sitting here for an hour and a half talking to you or talking at you. But uh, here's a, another little piece. Whatever an education is, it should make you a unique individual, not a conformist. It should furnish you with an original spirit with which to tackle the big challenges. It should allow you to find values which will be your roadmap through life. It should make you spiritually rich, a person who loves whatever you are doing, wherever you are whomever you are with. It should teach you what is important, how to live life, how to die. What's gotten in the way of education in the United States is a theory of social engineering that says there is one right way to proceed with growing up. That's an ancient Egyptian idea symbolized by the pyramid with an eye on top, one that's on the other side of, the, of George Washington on our $1 bill. Everything is a stone defined by its position on the pyramid. This theory has been presented in many different ways, but at bottom it signals a worldview of minds obsessed with the control of other minds, obsessed by dominance and strategies of intervention to maintain that dominance. Individuality, family, and community, on the other hand, are by definition expressions of singular organization, never of one right way thinking on a grand scale. Private time is absolutely essential if a private identity is going to develop, and private time is equally essential to the development of a code of private values without which we aren't really individuals at all. And I know I've talked at length about how school has worked to undermine individualism and now it's being explicit they're saying the quiet parts out loud perhaps it's time to try something different good fences make good neighbors said robert frost the natural solution to learn to learning to live together in a community is first to learn to live apart as individuals and as families only when you feel good about yourself can you feel good about others 
but we attack the problem of unity mechanically as though we could force an engineering solution by crowding the various families and communities under the broad homogenizing umbrella of institutions like compulsory schools. The outcome of this scheme was that the d democratic ideas that were only justification for our natural, national experiment were betrayed, were the only justification. The attempt at a shortcut continues and it ruins families and communities now just as it did then. Rebuild these things and young people will begin to educate themselves with our help just as they did at the nation's beginning. They don't have anything to work for now except money and it's never been a first class motivator. Break up these institutional schools, de decertify teaching, let anyone who has a mind to teach bid for customers, privatize this whole business, trust the free market system. I know it's easier said than done, but what other choice do we have? We need less school, not more. I couldn't agree more. And if you go to my website, um, before I even upload this, so you know, I didn't do it in connection with this. I just read this chapter about half an hour before I sat down to do this. And I certainly didn't go and edit it. My website will tell you exactly the same thing. And I came up with that all by my lonesome. So I'm pretty proud of myself. I didn't read this book. And yet I knew that education is not schooling. Schooling is uh is, is, is not what we need more of. We need less. Imagine, imagine it without schooling. That's what I have to say. That is the reason we learn. So thank you for joining me for another chapter of this wonderful book. I hope you will consider getting it and reading it in its entirety for yourself. It is truly wonderful and you will get all the parts I skipped and I did skip a lot. But thank you for watching. As always, I hope you will consider subscribing to the channel, like this video, comment on this video, share this video. That's the video.